Welcome to Beyond the Frontline Podcast, where your hosts, U.S. Air Force veterans, Donna Hoffmeyer and Jay Johnson, will help you transition from the front line to the home front. Listen every other Wednesday as they will bring great conversations, resources, tips, and feel good stories that will resonate and relate. Now, here's your hosts, Donna Hoffmeyer and Jay Johnson. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Front Line. This is one of your co-hosts. My name is Jay Johnson, and I am in studio with the one, the only, my incredible friend, and quickly becoming a business partner. We're involved in so many endeavors. The one and only Miss Donna Hoffmeyer. Hello, how are you? I am doing exceptional as always, my friend. You, you, are, you are You are battling some allergies. Uh, the San Antonio area is notorious this time of year for... 10 million pounds of pollen per hour. And it's all in my head right now. God, (laughs) I feel like a bowling ball is on my shoulders right now. I know. Actually, yesterday, I thought I was coming down with a cold. That's what I really thought. I I want you staying home, not coming to the studio. Well, I consider doing it from my house. And then I, when I got up and got moving, and then I was like, you know, it really is just allergies. So I'll come bug So if I'm sick in a week, I'm going to call you. Well, you've been sick more than me. I think you've got a bigger immune system. And in fairness, you were helping helping me with an activity about a year and a half ago. And I said to you, we need to stop. I need to go to the ER. I said, I, something feels wrong. I feel like I have COVID. And you're like, oh, I'm sure you're fine. I went and I was positive. You were so, positive. So you were around me when I was, you know, not feeling really well. I think yours is just allergies. I'm just picking I, I on do you. Too. Oh my God, yeah. it's been horrible. So we've been trying to like, just kind of push through. And then we have all this misty rain, but it's not heavy enough to suppress the I, yeah. so now it's humid and, and anybody who lives in the south you know we have like everything's wet so it's like cold is wet and, and, and green and yellow wet green and yellow yes. right because it yeah it just kind of settles on cars and on everything, everything. Exactly. patio furniture yeah god so you just feel like wet and then it's not pushing the pollen down, yeah. so you're stuffy. If people up north right now are saying, I don't want to hear about you. Yeah, snow. yeah, in snow, you complaining about. Did I say this? I probably said this in another podcast, but my cousin was in steamboats. Mm. And they had this year unprecedented levels. They're at over 400 inches of snow. They can keep every bit of it. Oh, That's, my gosh. There's a reason I live in Me South too. Central Texas. I'm telling you Me right now. Me too. I don't miss this. Even snow. when it, we, I've probably said this on a previous podcast, Donna, when the temperature drops below 50, I think, how much further south do I have to move? No. I mean, I'm going to end up in Belize or somewhere by the time I'm 60, which isn't far off. My and it's what, 70 today? And I yeah. have like a t-shirt a little and a breaker. jacket it's on. It's a little bit of a windbreaker. Horrible, I know. Well, good. Hey, we got a, we're got still doing this uh, this series and we've got we another are. really amazing guest joining us. I'm kind of excited about this today because I want to learn more about how she started doing what she's doing and she's pretty awesome pretty so awesome she yeah. is she is i'm gonna let's talk about the next aspect so we're gonna talk about so we we've talked to the judge this is veteran treatment court this yes. is our series yeah. right so we've talked to judge stevens we've talked to mike fogarty who is a peer service coordinator That's a lot. Yeah. yes so he does basically he coordinates all the the peer mentors for the treatment court these are all the, the people that that volunteer to work with the people, participants of the treatment court. Awesome. And so we've worked, we talked with him. Then we talked with um, Laura Ballo. Yep. And she's pretty amazing. And we, so we talked. She was fun. Yeah. Right. Court coordinator, but God, she has this enormous background and she's a veteran, right? Yep. She's a Navy. Well, she's currently Navy she's reserve. reserve. And she's a super, like super human. Because, human being in the middle. Oh, superhuman. Like she is superhuman. Yeah. Like, like, uh above and beyond kind of energy and ability and six children three months six month old twins yep. navy reserve and a husband that's out of pocket because his job takes him out of state i can barely she's my take hero care of what i have to take uh, care of exactly yeah. um and so now we're gonna do another angle of the treatment court and so this is the probation officer and so we have with us Yenevive Lopez, and I'm going to read a little bit about her before you get to say hi, Genevieve. And so she has been with Veteran Treatment Court um, for not super long, but, oh, since 2019. So I've been a probation officer since 2019, and she's supervised uh, several caseloads, 
ranging from direct bond and now in the veteran treatment court caseload. Mm. And she started working this that I knew it was earlier. She started working this caseload in December 22. She just stepped in this position. Oh, good. But she was a probation officer back since 19. So she has an experience being yeah. a probation officer. Now, here's the thing with her. And I love her. So I meet everybody before we actually do the podcast just to give them some, you know, what the expectation is and put them at ease that we're not going to ambush them or yeah. anything like that. So she pops on the screen and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's adorable. Okay. And I, I mean that in a complimentary way. She's beautiful and she's super nice and she got the be- most beautiful smile. And, and I was like, I bet every single person as a participant challenges her. She goes, they start that way. They don't end that way. Oh, I'm sure that's true, right? <laughs> so, I've learned long time ago. It's uh, it's the heart in the person, not, you know, they that, look- not the size of the person <laughs> that can determine, you exactly. know, how you end up. And I'm going to let her talk about that because yeah. honestly, that is a reality. And we will talk about that in a little while. But in the meantime, I want to introduce you. Hello, Genevieve. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are y'all? Good. good really good. good. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's exciting. I think, like I said, when we met, as soon as you popped up, I was like, wow, immediately mm-hmm. bias in the mind starts. I'm like, they probably eat her alive, or at least they try to when they see you. Because Definitely. you're young, you're beautiful. You get a big, beautiful smile. And I think any person walk in the door and go, she's a pushover. I, I have no doubt <laughs> she can handle her own. That's what I'm thinking. Oh, I, she handles yeah, her own. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and actually, if I'm not mistaken, before that you worked in a construction um, company, right? Oh, I did. We I worked for a roofing company. Definitely hold her own. Then I mean, I <laughs> work with construction companies, and I know exactly what that group is like. So if if she survives that, there's nothing. That That's the exact company. I'm like, oh, you did yeah. that before. I'm yeah. like, oh, you're you got this. She goes, yeah. It's She's not heard things, seen things that most people wouldn't even be able to. They would fathom. blush many yeah. times over. At. <laughs> right, right. So, all right. So, Gen- Genevieve, I, I have to giggle. You're gonna hear me like mess her name up somewhere because it's spelled Y E N A I V, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but the the cute story is that she's always been called Genevieve. And her parents will sometimes say Genevieve and, or how do they say it? Genevieve. Genevieve, right. And she's like, I just go with Genevieve. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they've been calling me that since I was little. And then they just recently were like, just kidding. That's not your name. And I was like, oh no, this isn't a thing. (laughs) No, it is. (laughs) Well, look, I'm right there with you. I mean, Jay is what I go by and it's nowhere in my actual name. So, you know, I'm right there with you, my friend. Yeah, you don't. You don't look like a Robert. I don't. No. Now you, you just gave away the trade secret. You look all like that. a J. Yeah. <laughs> when I heard that, I was like, "What? No, you're a J. <laughs> it, it suits you better." All right. So let's talk about your background, Genevieve, and and kind of where you started and where you're at. Let's kind of go from there. So, I mean, I went to school for criminal justice. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I tried like everything. I was like. When I was little, I wanted to be an attorney and I was like, that's like my goal in life. And then I was like, no, just kidding. I want to be a nurse. And then (laughs) so I tried doing that for a little bit. And then I was like, no, I'm going to go back to criminal justice because I really do like that. And I got a job at a roofing company because I got an associates in business. And I was just like managing that job for a long time while also finishing my bachelor's in criminal justice. And when I graduated, I got a call from probation that they were looking for employees. And I thought it was a scam. I was like, they don't just call you for a job. And no, it ended up being like a real thing. And like, I applied and I got the job. And then I started working here like two months after I graduated. And that's literally where my career just started. I was like, super thankful that it went so quickly for me. I love hearing that Leary part about they just called me and I wasn't sure. You know, it's not like you show up and there's a whole line of people and then they're like, just kidding, you're selling encyclopedias. Yeah, basically. <laughs> I was like, wait, this can't be real. They don't just call you up for a job. And <laughs> they did. Like, I was like, I had just finished my resume adding like, wow. that I just graduated and they called me and they asked if I wanted to apply. And I did. And I got the job shortly after that, but it was really cool. Where'd you go to school, if you don't mind me asking? 
Texas State. Oh, very cool. Okay. Yep. Nearby, local. Yeah. Awesome. Did yeah. you, um, but, so where was your first probation officer job? This was it. Um, oh. So I was in Comal County and I got it there. That was my first probation office. And I started at the main office and then I just started getting moved around a lot. Oh, uh, gotcha. So I was, but still, I'm still within Comal County. We're just further out out at a different cool. Nice. Yeah. And I said, you just stepped in. Cause I remember when we were setting up for the interviews, they're like, the probation officer just changed. I'm like, just when, just now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, so I was like, well, I'm busy inter- getting everybody else lined up. And then, so it's been a couple of months. I'm like, that gives her enough time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's been really fun. So it's yeah. enjoyable. <laughs> okay. Donna's the brain trust to finding people like you to join us you know she (laughs) she goes out and finds these really incredible stories and people doing incredible things my part is just to show up and look pretty on screen which is why we only release audio right it tells me a lot you know she she reminds me all the time I have a face for radio no it's it's me I refuse to wear makeup (laughs) you can see how lighthearted we are Genevieve (laughs) on these so, so how is the um so how is it going? So you stepped in this in December. I mean, you are you you've been doing it, but here specifically since December. So what are you seeing? Tell us about the program and and how it's going for you in that. So the program's going really well. Luckily, before like I completely transitioned into veterans treatment court, um, I was able to shadow like the prior officer and oh, she was amazing and she like left so many notes and she like let me transition into it like really smoothly and um so it made it a lot easier to like learn what I was doing because I was watching her half the time and then she would just like even before I completely took over she would be like hey just try it out like just work with me and try this out um so it's been really fun um we get like a binder and it has like all the information about veterans treatment court and gives you all the rules that you can and can't do and like what I can do um, with me, they see me a lot more than they would like see the court because they see me like at least there's like different phases that they go through. So like the first phase, like they will see me weekly mm-hmm. and then it's kind of like a short transition into like knowing what veterans court is kind of like figuring it out. And it's like, it's, it's a lot at first. So like you try to like ease them into it, like, okay, well, let's start here. Then we'll move further to the next step, which is why like, it's important to see them weekly um and then once they get into like phase two through like phase four then that's when like we start seeing them twice twice a month I have a question for you Genevieve around that so I'm I'm a certified coach so I work with people you know one-on-one and Mm -hmm. uh for me I want to have them be proactive I I want them to take the initiative to reach out to me right if we have a set meeting I expect them to take the lead on that and to Mm -hmm. be where they're supposed to be how does that work with you? So as you're meeting with them, as you go through the phases, is is it you that's reaching out and doing the check-ins or do you require them? Hey, listen, this is my expectation. I want to hear from you. I want to hear from you in this frequency. How does that work? So the first visit, obviously, like it's a lot of me, like I schedule their first visit and I'm like, come see me. Let me explain how all of this works. Because I do see them in court and it's just like, they just finished going through the court and it's like a lot. So then I go in and read like their conditions and all that entails, which can take a while. And it's, it's a lot for them to handle at first. Cause it's like, I just went through like all of this. I don't even know what's going on sometimes. Um, well, they do know what's going on, but it just becomes a lot. It's over. And so, yeah. Um, so the first visit I try to explain everything. And, and after that, like, I'm like, okay, here's my number. I gave you the next report date, which they like schedule with me, um, with whatever works for their schedule. And then it's on them to like, remember, um, they've have in their binder, their veterans binder, they have a calendar where they like are supposed to schedule everything and put in there, like all their meetings with me and court. So it's really on them. Like they call me if they need anything. Um, of course we do have random drug tests. So that's like, sometimes I call them and just like, Hey, come in. Um, but for the most part, it's mainly them. Like they pretty much take an initiative after good. Like I think after the first like two, three weeks of like coming to see me, they kind of get the hang of it. Like, okay, like she's here, she'll help me. And it it if I need anything, just call her. 
it, you know, I'm a firm believer in indicators, right? Paying attention to indicators. There's leading, there's lagging indicators, but a leading indicator that someone has the potential to be successful is them taking the initiative, right? So right. to hear you say that is really uh, reassuring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, most, I've never had an issue with any of them. Like the, it, as a general, like they all take initiative and they're like, very like, I th like I said, after in the first three weeks, like it's like, okay, it's a lot. You just went over all these rules and instructions and how all of this works. Like, who do I contact for this? Who do I contact for that? Because veterans treatment court's a team. So sometimes it gets confusing who to go to. So it, it makes it a lot easier when we're able to like talk one-on-one -on -one a lot of the times. What what do you see as the, um, I think I asked Laura this question too, like what do you see in the big picture um, what they're struggling with like what got them there you know what I mean I I think what I would see is um maybe not admitting that there was an issue or they are dealing with something I mm -hmm. think that's one of the biggest things that I see mm -hmm. um like you're kind of just like avoiding the actual the root of the problem basically and it just keeps going on and going on and then finally like they get into this part of the legal system and it becomes um, a bigger issue where they don't know where to go after that. They don't know where to get the help or they don't even might not even know what the issue is until you start like going through like the treatment. It's like, okay, this is what's really happening. Like this is what's going on. And so I think that's where they end up in this situation sometimes. But that's a very interesting comment that you make because um I have had people, because so before I got out of the military, I mean, I'm a nurse by trade, and the last job I was doing was taking care of garden reserve um, and helping them connect with their medical care as a, as a clinical case manager. And I remember a couple times, more than a couple times, that they were having issues and sometimes it was physical issues and they actually didn't realize that some of this was stemming from mental health issues, P you know, mostly PTSD, but there were some too that were drinking and weren't associating it with PTSD um, and weren't getting the help. And so um, it, when you say that, I'm like, yeah, I, how many of them, well, Laura said to me, because I asked her this question, how many of them that are in the court system are dealing with PTSD, anxiety, depression um, that have been not medically boarded from the military? Do you know? You know, I'm not sure exactly, because most of them now, like, since I came in late, like, most of them have already been going through, like, the treatment process and everything. Mm -hmm. Um so I, you know, I'm not sure how many of them have done that or not. There was a, there was a big, um, it was back in the nineties, the late nineties that a lot of people were getting separated before they really understood PTSD that well, they were just mm -hmm. sending them out the door and then they're having like all these adjustment issues and all these problems. And then they finally recognized like, holy cow, like the drinking, they're not just an alcoholic, they're not just randomly drinking, they're coping. This is a coping mechanism. The drugs were a coping mechanism or, or the, the gambling, the sex or whatever. Um, and so they started recognizing that, right? And since that 90s time frame, we've been advancing, advancing. Laura actually said something on the last podcast, put me in a little bit of a soapbox because it got me. And, and nothing against her, it's, it's just what she said. She said she noticed that some of these guys coming out um, are getting separated for drinking drugs uh, and not medically boarded. And so now when they get out, they don't have any financial stability. They're just separated with no, no, no medical support, no nothing, you know, unless they're getting into the VA. So yeah. I was just wondering how, if you see any of that also on your end. Um, I, yes, I do see that because some of them don't know where to go. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing is like, okay, well, I'm out. I just went through all of this. Now what? what do I do now? And then they start dealing with this stuff and it's like, okay, well, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know how this happened. So coming into the veterans court, like I said, we have a whole group and we have people that can help you out and like start with like getting the help that you need and getting into either counseling or treatment, anything that could help. 
um but it's it's really cool to see how like how much they're they're helping them and like getting them appointments getting them like the doctors that they need and everything and it's it's just awesome to see that and we're able to like remind them like hey don't forget you have this appointment too because also like they've never some of them have never seen anybody so it's like forgetful you know oh I have like the stock appointment that I didn't even know about and it's it's really cool to see how much like they've been helping them you know what I love Genevieve listening to you kind of share and talk and the things that Donna was bringing in you know we we've been talking often about choices Mm -hmm. and uh you kind of said you know sometimes they don't want to accept their part in this I'm paraphrasing right I'm putting it in the way I received what you said, feel free to correct me. But I think that's such an important success thing that people who are successful in life generally are the ones that uh, take responsibility for themselves, for their actions. They don't look to assign external blame. And uh, But that being said, if there are some undiagnosed things there, right? This is where we get into problems of treating symptoms rather than what's the root cause behind something. And so what you all are doing in the Veterans Treatment Court, I think, as an objective outside party, is recognizing that veterans uh, have seen and done things unique from most of society that it could play a part in and need to get to the heart of that. And then they need to be willing to, you know, participate in the program and follow your guidance. I mean, if I was to sit down with you, Genevieve, and you were to lay out, hey, I'll here's all the conditions. I want to comply, right? Like I see you as an advocate for Mm -hmm. me. And there are so many other ways that could be adjudicated. So I'd be very thankful for you. Do you generally find that the people in the program processing, graduating, completing the program recognize and appreciate all the work you all are doing on their behalf? Yes, definitely. Um, I have heard a lot that they really do enjoy that there's always somebody here. That's awesome. There's always They have a support system and they, they're well aware of that. And I think that's great that they know that, you know, like you're, you're not alone and all this stuff. We're always going to be here. Even when you graduate, like we're still, hey, if you want to come by my office and just have yeah. a little chit chat and tell me how you're doing, my door is always open for I you. I love that. So, yeah. yeah. And do that's they good. get to stick with their mentor after the after the program is complete? I believe so. Um, I think they can still talk to them. I'm not 100% yeah. sure, but I know like they share each other's cell phones. So I think they still oh, like yeah. communicate with them. Well, at the minimum, there's, I wouldn't think there'd be something that would preclude them, no, no. right? Yeah, but there may not be a formalized so. process. Right. Yeah. yeah there's it's, it, their choice. Because mentors, right? I always need and want mentors in my own life. I would, hopefully they don't abuse that right? I mean, that's the difference. You don't want someone monopolizing someone else's time when they're there to, I don't know if that makes sense, but. You know, yeah. As long as it's a mutual agreement is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mutually agreeing to to keep moving forward. Feel free to reach out to me anytime and every night at two in the morning or three, you know. Right, that might be excessive. (laughs) I do sleep on occasion, yeah. What's your, um, in, in the big picture, what's your relapse rate? Like, how many of these people do you see either a go through the program or relapse within the program? So since I just started, I haven't seen that happen yet. So um, I'm hoping that I don't see that. Yeah. But um, yeah, since I've been here, I haven't seen that. So okay. there's, there's, it seems like there's a big success with it. Let, let's not, I'm going to take us out of veteran treatment just for a moment. I just want to talk to you as a probationary officer. Yeah. <laughs> we have to bring it up because yeah, I, I, yeah, it's fascinating to me, and I've got other friends who have done it. And coincidentally enough, a really close dear friend of mine who was on active duty with me when she left uh, military service, she is still a probationary office out in New Mexico, a probationary officer out in New Mexico. That's awesome. And uh, in in kind of small stature, and I'm telling you right now, I know she can hold her own. What do you love, Genevieve? I mean, just in general about being a probationary officer what do you love about what you do day to day everything yeah um honestly it's so nice um it's it's a lot of work but I think just being able to be there for them and like help any of the anybody that goes to the legal system is just really nice you know um some of them just make one mistake and like it could be any of us at any point you know and I think that's just being here for them and like, you know, getting them through the whole process of being on probation and like what they need to complete and stuff. Um, 
I, I honestly, I just love, I love it all. It's so nice. It's nice being able to like, I have, I've had like some people that like still come and like, they'll be like, Hey, thank you for everything. And I'm like, wow, you know, that's like exactly what I wanted. Mm, that's a win. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just said to somebody this morning, Genevieve, so hearing you say that, it kind of makes me think. I, To me, wealth today is described by lights I touch. So mm-hmm. a friend of mine just got promoted on active duty yesterday. He worked for me almost 20 years ago. It's hard for me to say that. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was 20 years ago, actually. And And somebody at his ceremony sent me a text while it was going on and said, he just mentioned you by name. Oh. And I thought, man... If I can spend the rest of my days helping someone in some way, touching their life, that does it for me. I think one of my, the biggest honors I ever got is when people want me to um, re-enlist them. Yeah, that's exciting. Like, and I've done a couple right here at Randolph and um, there's a a massive flagpole, you know, right up, right by the, uh, we call the Taj Taj, Mahal there. And I've done a couple there, you know, and that, this is the biggest. For them to think of you. Honor, yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, okay. Genevieve, I've got a part B. Okay. (laughs) If you share with me what you love about your job, what is most challenging about being a probationary officer? Ooh, um, I think that, that intro struggle, that, at the beginning of any person that goes through probation like it's like I don't I don't care for this who are you Mm. who are you to tell me all this and I'm like that you're right that's true but and then like them thinking that I'm just here to see them fail that's not my goal my goal is not to see you fail I want you to get out of this and put this behind you and never come through this again and I think trying to get that into them like for them to understand that that's probably my biggest struggle with everybody that goes through probation in general it this popped in my head when you were saying that i i took care of a service member i had pretty significant ptsd he's very very bright guy and and he he could articulate very well in describing what it was like to we used to call it the peak and the trough right like Mm -hmm. they all go through peaks and troughs the problem the whole goal is never to unpack when you're in the trough right and he said, at his worst, he said, if you can imagine, he goes, somebody at their worst with PTSD um, are all balled up. And he's like, there could be 50 hands reaching out to them and you can't even raise a pinky to get that help. Mm. And so I think about That's these hard. guys and girls that have made, the, you know, un- unfortunate decisions, right? And boom, now they're in your office and they weren't even they weren't consciously asking for help. They ended up getting help through their decisions, but now they've got somebody there and they're like, look, that person's going to help you. And they're just like, I don't even have the energy to be helped. You know what I mean? And so you've got them there and you're going to be like, listen, I'm going to hold you for a little bit until you can put the first foot on the ground. And then you're going to put the second one and then you're going to take a baby step and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where you get them, right? Where you're just like, I'll hold you for a little bit, but this is going to be forever because you're going to do this, you know? Right. Yeah. That's definitely a good way of like explaining that. Like, all of that. <laughs> is there any, is there any part of you, Genevieve, where there's still a little bit of, I don't know, maybe someday I'll go to law school and go back to the initial dream. Or is this, is this really it is, I know no one can predict the future, but I hear you say you really love, you know, what you're doing. And I believe you, I see it in your face and in the way that you speak. Uh, But I just, earlier when you said, you know, I got into criminal justice because I had this dream of one day being an attorney. And you said, then I kind of steered away from that. Anything in you still say, oh, it, it interests me. I think so. I think I would just want to go to law school just to get that knowledge. Mm. But um, I don't think, I don't know if I would actually want to be a lawyer or an attorney. I, um, I think I would just want to do it just so I can say, hey, I did it and I achieved my goal. But that's not really what I like. Yeah. Um, honestly, I've like, we've always, even in our work, like we always talk about, okay, so what's next, you know? Um, you've been here since you were in your 20s like what's next and I'm like honestly like I see myself retiring here and I don't see myself leaving anytime soon um and that's like one of the biggest things is like I don't I don't wake up in the morning and go gosh I hate my job I wake up in the morning I'm like I'm going to work I'm going you know I like it 
Uh, so, and I think that was like the thing my mom always told me, if you wake up in the morning, you're not happy, then there's an issue. And I mean, I don't have that. It's not most people, Genevieve, I would tell yeah. you, but mm -hmm. Donna and I talk about this often. Most people I personally meet and, and Donna too, out in some really big circles of people, most people loathe what they do for a living mm -hmm. and they really are dissatisfied in their life. And I think you can change that, you know, so that <laughs> you say that you love what you do. You're excited when you get up in the morning to go do it. Thank you for saying that. Cause I love hearing people that have found their place. And you know, what's really cool is like I said, we've interviewed a lot of people we within, have. within this treatment course yeah. specifically, yeah. right? We're not going to all different ones, this specific treatment this course specific. and everybody we have talked to amazing loves their job. It's amazing. Judge Stevens loves his job, right? I thought he was retiring. Like that's where, like I do some work with them on some advocacy stuff. And it's funny because he, he said like, I want to get this started, Donna, but I want to get the ball rolling. I don't want my fingers to own it because I don't know where I'm going to be, which I took that as like, probably be retiring in the near future until he comes back and says, no, I'm going for office the next time. And I'm yeah. like, he's still going, you know? So, you know, Mike was the same way, but you know, Mike Fogarty just went from full-time to part-time. He didn't leave. He's like, mm -hmm. I'm retiring. And I teased him and I said, so what does that look like? And he said, well, there's this part-time position. And I said, oh, so instead of five, eight hour days, you're now <laughs> doing what? Like four and a half. Yeah, you know, he's doing two sixteen, right? You know, and he goes, "Hush, don't say that." <laughs> like, not because, but you can tell he still is very connected to that, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. Laura, I mean, that girl, I'm telling you, superwoman, right? And the oh, nicest person, and just full of energy. And I'm like, and then now Genevieve, and now I mean, Genevieve, right? So everybody, like, I was it's like, amazing what? To me. Like, I want to go. Well, I do kind of work with you guys on the side, yeah. but like, you know, like, if I had to go get another nine to five. I'd probably I'd be write looking to see like, what opened. Yeah, an old retired nurse for anything that <laughs> veteran background. Yeah, paper pusher. Yeah, I'll be your paper pusher. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because why? Because that is really good energy. Like it I is. always said, I, I would, love good. Energy. I would rather be on a sinking boat with people that I totally enjoyed working with and go down together than on this quote unquote successful one with people that you, you do not resonate with, you know what I mean? Okay. And so when I see that, you know, the energy is super good, is. you know, and I'm like, I, the people that are going through that treatment court are extremely lucky. Yeah. They I really agree. are. I say that with a hundred percent sincerity. They are very blessed to be able to have this second opportunity, you know. Are there are there state licenses and things that you have to acquire to be a probationary officer? Yes. So I go through I went through a certification before I got hired, or actually a few months after I got hired. Okay. Um, and we went through like this whole, I want to say it was like a week thing of just training and training. Um, and then we take a test and that certifies us to be a probation officer. Got um, it. but we still have to do like training hours every year. We have to have a minimum of hours. CEU so, stuff, you know, CEU credit, uh, education credits. Yeah. Education credits. Are those what those are to just maintain a level of proficiency or? Uh, no, it's more like training hours, like different, they, TDCJ like sends us like all these different type of like webinars that we have to do. Oh, um, and it'll keep like, we have to have a certain amount of hours every year yeah. um, to even like continue with our certification for like TDC. So, yeah, no, that makes sense. I just think our listeners, you know, if, if they've been listening to the series at this point, they've now learned about this really unique structure called a veterans treatment court, but they're certainly are familiar with probation officers, you know, case managers, attorneys wow. at a high level, but so they may infer what that looks like, but I want people to understand that not only are these people serving in these capacities, but they they're maintain. highly trained. Yeah, they've- and Don't yeah. do what I keep doing. Like I confuse- mentally i know the difference but there's a part of me that like i hear a probation officer and then i hear the song bad boys come in my head oh boy <laughs> so did you do any hand-to-hand -hand combat training or anything or the the bail bond guys right you see them all glorified on tv like i just saw one the other day and i was like oh my lord uh so 
you're not, you know, you're not sitting there doing hand to hand combat training or anything no. like that, right? <laughs> no, I think we just get like a really cool badge sometimes. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. We hear probation officer. It's like when we hear TI, we're like, oh. Yeah, get your attention. Like we, we're like, okay. <laughs> Don't mess with them. That's what that term comes with. He's your probation officer. Don't mess with them. Right. And, oh, yeah. and I, that's why I was kind of joking. And, and uh, you know, we were saying, you know, you, you have a very bright personality, and very vibrant and very engaging. And I have no doubt the people coming through that are really not in the best point in their life are like looking over going, oh, hell no. I, I'm This Pollyanna is not going to do me in. You know what I mean? Like that kind yeah. of mentality. And, and then do you run into that, that, that beginning challenge? Like how does that happen or how does it work out? <laughs> yes, I do actually. So like nor all the time, like I'm always super friendly because I feel like, you know, like we're Everything. still humans. I'm going to be myself with everyone. Absolutely. And then like they start like, you know, trying to test it and test it. And I'm like, no, nope, you can't do that. So then it like becomes more of an issue like, oh, well, why not? And you're my friend. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm still your probation officer. Like first, <laughs> I'm here for you to come to me. But at the end of the day, I'm still your probation officer too. So yeah, it's, it's a struggle sometimes because you don't really know, like, do I start off as being mean? Do I start off as like being super nice? Here's but, the boundaries, right? I manage yeah. expectations, Geneva, yeah. I would imagine, or yeah. Yeah, big part of that. Geneva, are you allowed, uh, permitted, or comfortable even describing what a typical day for you looks like? Um, yeah. So I normally have like people scheduled um in veteran since I've switched to veterans court, um, it is a little bit smaller because there's more one-to-one um visits with Sure. The individuals that are in the program but even before that like we would have like maybe like five six people that we would see a day and so like we make our own schedule so we try to work with everybody that goes to probation or that ha- needs a probation officer so whatever really works for them as well um so we try to make our schedule to work with them like it starts at like eight and then I have people throughout the day and sure. just and do you meet with the, when I say the team, Judge Stevens, because I always hear Mondays, like Mondays, everybody's locked into like this meeting day, you know what I mean? So what is, how do you fit in with this team of the Veteran Treatment Court? So every Monday, I just pretty much set it all out the whole afternoon for it to just be Veterans Court that day. Mm-hmm. Um, so we meet like shortly after lunch and then we're with the team for a few hours and then we go into court um right after that but yeah every every monday is completely blocked up for just so when you guys are meeting with the team are you kind of given background on what's coming like what you're going to see in court who's coming in what their needs are or is yeah yeah we pretty much talk about everything that's been going on um of course like um since i see them more often they, I get asked a lot, like how everybody's doing. Um, so I pretty much just let them know how everyone's going, whether their conditions are being met, still in compliance with everything. And then everybody just shares their part of what's been going on that they've seen as well. And it, so if, if there's, so I'm thinking of the different people that we've talked to. So if, if you see somebody struggling in an area, would you talk to Mike Fogarty and be like, Hey, is he, is the, is the mentor and them working together or, or it would be better if they could meet more? I mean, do you share info like that? Do you give advice? Do you recommendations or? Yes, but um, so it's, we pretty much make the recommendations as a team. Okay. Um, I can bring up a subject and then everybody is aware of it. What some people can say, no, we don't really like that. Um, some others can say yes. Uh, it's still up to judge whatever he wants to do at the end of the day. Um, but we all kind of put in our own little, since it's a lot of us, um, we put in our own little thought on it. And it, I mean, we have the DAs, the defense attorneys, uh, the VGA was Michael, Laura too. Like everybody just kind of is in there. And I mean, we're all like, we all have a different part of veterans court. So we all put it all together and then we make our final decision as a whole team. 
Very I cool. Like that. yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. I mean, I said it, it's really neat. Every time we talk to somebody else, I'm just like, God, you still learn something new yeah, true. and different little angles of it, how you guys <laughs> across it. I, I want to bring up something. I wrote this down and you made a comment and it just kind of rang in my head, both of you, when you were talking about this ownership, right? You see this Genevieve where like, if they're not owning it, it it's not going to be better, right? And and they can't heal if they're not owning their part and they're they're not being responsible for their their part in it, right? Well, I don't necessarily mean that if they don't take ownership in it, then it's not going to work. Because sometimes they might not know that there is an issue at all. And it's like, how do I take ownership when I don't even know that there is one, you know? That's a really good point. And and it's like, you know, we go through this process and it's like, okay, well, this has been going on. Okay, so and I mean that's that's why we have like them go to tr- not all of them go to treatment, but they like meet with different people that may be able to address like, oh, well, how did you end up here? You know, and then that's when like, I'm sure they start talking about it because I'm not on that side of the right part. And I mean, not all of that gets shared with me either. So I just see them like when they come see me. But I mean, not all of it is just you deciding on if you can't accept that, then you, this isn't going to work because you might not know that there is something, you know, or there might not be anything at all. And you just made one simple mistake, you know? So it's just, well, <clears throat> but I think it starts with ownership of the choice they made that <laughs> led to the mistake, right. Which then put them in a situation where they're working with all of you, that part, they can at least own, even well, if there is an underlying thing that hasn't been uncovered, you this at is, least own the choice that you made. This was the point I was making when you guys were talking about it. I I had written down, Um, to talk about ownership so when I hear ownership like if I say to somebody well what's your piece to own in this situation there are a lot of people that could take offense to that and be like I didn't do it I didn't I'm not the one that you know I I got PTSD somebody traumatized me I didn't do that Mm -hmm. agreed right I've said this statement many times a person that's been through trauma and traumatized, they are not responsible for being traumatized, but they are responsible for the healing, right? So I'll give an example. This just happened recently. I went to breakfast with somebody um, and their partner um, years and years and years ago, uh, it was an MST, right? And an MST for the audience is a a military sexual trauma, right? So they had this happen in their military career. And the person says to me, she says, he just started talking about this a couple of years ago. And I went, really? And he's like, and he's told this person and she, and she started naming off all the people he started telling about it. And I said, he's owning it. That's awesome, right? So ownership doesn't mean like what part, it doesn't always mean what part are you responsible for that made this happen. Ownership is like, I'm embracing the situation. I'm looking at it from all angles and I am doing my part to make it better, right? And so when you guys were talking about that, that's what was popping in my head is like, I want people to understand that when we say ownership, it doesn't always mean, well, what part, or that you cause the problem. What That's not what that means all the time. It's like, what part of the ownership, what part of that situation can you control? That's mm-hmm. what ownership is, right? And so you right. can't control the trauma that happened to you. That, that doesn't, that's not, a, nobody's going to blame you for something horrible that happened to you. You, you don't own that. But right. now that this happened and, and now you're having physical responses, mental health responses, you're drinking too much, you're isolating from your family, you have the responsibility to try to get in a better place. Yeah, that's good. You know, so anyways, that was yeah. just what popped in my head. No, about that's it. good. Genevieve, what uh, we're starting to get close to landing the plane mm-hmm. here. We always appreciate, you know, you, anyone that takes the time to sit with us in this space to share and educate others. What haven't we touched on that, you know, maybe is on your heart, mind that you would just want to share? Oh, um, I think we pretty much touched a lot of stuff. Um, honestly, thank y'all for doing this and putting it out there more. Like, I think that's really great that 
you know, you're getting the side of it and for more people to understand and like know that there is a court that could help with anything that you may need. And I think that's really awesome. I had no idea. I've shared that on every one of these episodes yeah. where we've been talking to some of your your peers and colleagues and truly uh I had no idea. Six months ago is when I first Man, heard any of this talked about and I'm like, wait, what? So yeah, Genevieve, I mean, I'll I'll just say to you what I've said to your colleagues and mean it from the fiber of my being. Thank you uh, for what you're all doing. I think it's amazing. I love that this opportunity exists. You know, we don't want anyone to end up in a situation where they need your services. But if they do, we're thankful that you're there advocating on behalf of veterans, recognizing that veterans many times do have some very unique uh, extenuating circumstances is what I would say. And then, you know, I, I hope that they recognize it as an opportunity and they fully participate in it and get to a place of well of health and wealth mm -hmm. and well-being. And mm -hmm. right. So thank you, Genevieve. Really, really, it's uh, amazing what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I, I second that all the way. And I don't really have a lot more to add, except that, you know, I hope people listening to this kind of start being curious, you know, there is room for people to volunteer and be a mentor. There's a huge need for mentors and the veteran treatment court exists at almost every County in, in every state, almost, I don't know if it's a hundred percent, but it's very, very yeah, high. It's amazing. Yeah. And so I mean, I started under fact, different nomenclature, maybe but yeah. different naming conventions. Yeah. And every place has, you know, a little different setup. And, and if you are aware of a veteran treatment court and they don't have a mentoring program, be the change, offer it up. You know, yeah. Judge yeah. Stevens saw that I was important and, and he included it and not every county has that. So, um, yeah, you know, like wealth, is, you know, information is not, is, is a wealth. Oh, yeah. I don't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> it's all good. Information is important. <laughs> and the more you have, the more knowledge that you have, it's, it, just share it, you know, and you get it out there and, and who knows what change you can make with that. So yeah, it's good. All right. You good? I'm good. I I just, yeah, blown away again, honored to get to meet Genevieve, honored about, you know, to spend time with amazing human beings out there that have compassion, empathy uh, for others. All yeah. All of that. So this is fun. All right. All right, everybody, as always, we are so grateful that you guys are following us. Please like, share, comment, engage. This is a very interesting topic, and we would love to get your input on this. Um, and so if you email Coming Home Well, the information gets to us. So from all of us here at Coming Home Well and Beyond the Front Line, you guys have an awesome week. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks for listening to Beyond the Front Line a podcast of Coming Home Well. Join us every other Wednesday. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. Thanks again. And until all are home and all are well.